Good evening, everyone. I hope I can hear myself. I will know, I guess, in a second. Thank you for coming. Today is the third part of... Uh, yes, I can hear myself. Um, the third part of um, Honor Art Bot's Windows Kernel Debugging Series. There will be another part tomorrow, so um, I will... Well, I already invite you to it, but I will remind you about it, I guess, after uh, Honorary Bot stops his um, live stream, which will take about, I guess, one and a half hour today, same as last week. One more note is that Murmur CTF is going to actually start streaming right after this live stream, so once, well, my stream is over, you can switch to his channel and watch him try to find bugs in... Uh, Windows 95, I believe, or Internet Explorer in Windows 95 or something, like that, something crazy like that, so that should be an enjoyable stream. And that's it. Without further ado, I switch to Honorary Bot. Please welcome him and enjoy. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, Artyom Honorary Bot uh, Shushkin is here. It's the third part on Windows kernel debugging series and today I'd like to talk about virtual address space that is on Windows, right? But uh, we've been talking uh, a lot about WinDBG, about setting it up, about how to use that and although I'd like to talk mostly about the virtual address space on Windows, random kernel questions are appreciated today. You're welcome uh, to like some for some off-topic questions, but about Windows kernel, I'll try to answer answer them. So, yeah, uh, I'd like to share my approach on debugging and reverse engineering stuff. So, uh, I've been watching for um, some CDFs, right? I got my friends that play CDFs. And when I look how they do that, because I'm too lazy to play those, uh, they mostly operate um, like this. They got a random like executable, and they start like trying it out, launch it, see what happens inside, and they're more about the logic of this executable. So uh, my approach is a little different. I prefer to work uh, from the environment, so I I prefer to research the environment that the program runs in, and to like you know, if I know that there are only one way to open the file, right? I will like breakpoint there. I, I'm not going going to miss the file creation or some sort of stuff, and. Once I understand how the program behaves in a certain environment, uh, I'll try to like reverse engineer its internal logic. It's the place where it works with its internal structures. So, but in order to get to know the environment well, I'd like to speak about virtual address space. And the very first topic on this one is uh, the virtual memory concept. You might be familiar, familiar the, with that one, but it's really important, especially for tomorrow's stream, where we will discuss the physical address space. So we're also talking about Intel platform with Intel memory management unit, right? So uh, yeah, let's go on. So I got here the Intel developers, developers manual uh, and um, and then here I got the AMD uh, sort of system programming manual, right? Is it this? Yes, it's the system programming manual. They're actually pretty much the same since we got the AMD 64 architecture uh, and actually AMD were the ones who created this one, but both Intel and AMD support it. Uh, yeah, and the difference between this manual is actually is that uh, AMD manual has more pictures. Yes. So 
the relevant picture about uh, virtual memory unit is this one. So, yeah, so I mean, it, it is too much. I'll just, yeah, try to do it like that. So, uh, the processor works with virtual addresses in a protected mode. Yeah, it operates in like, different modes, but uh, nowadays, it mostly, it uses protected mode. So, in a protected mode, we got like virtual addresses. Uh, and these virtual addresses uh, consist of several parts. So, it has a segment selector and the offset. And yeah, actually, when you go to the debugger, break in, we look into registers. We know that RIP register uh, is, uh, points to the memory where the code is executed, right? But yeah, it's not quite true because uh, it is not enough to know only RIP. Actually, processor executes uh, instructions at CSRIP, right? This CES is a segment selector, so it works like this. So this is the CES part and this is the RIP part. Uh, when we reference the data, we actually use different segment selectors like DES, like uh, ES, like FS, and GS. Uh, and for the stack, actually, we reference SS. RSP, not just RSP. Yeah, so uh, the segment selector is used for several like system related things such as current processor, uh, current privilege level, CPL, um, some attributes for the codes, for example, it defines whether we execute 64 bit code or 32 bit code or even 16 bit code, right? But uh, Aside of that, it has a base uh, which is uh, described in a, a global descriptor table. So the global descriptor table actually lives in a separate register in a processor. So we can view it as GDTR, so global descriptor table register, right? And it holds a linear address, which we're going to get like in a second. On what's with the linear address, but we can actually view this one. It displays the words, and we have uh, some data, which is actually a, a set of segment descriptors, right? So it is where the segment attributes are taken, like base, limit, and so on. Actually, let's take a look about on uh, what's the current. Uh, Segment selector, it's 10, right? The WinDBG has a built in comment which is DG uh, display. I don't know what, <laughs> I'm not sure about DG, but it uh, uh, shows us a descriptor. So, display, I guess, GDT descriptor or something. But still, yeah, selector and the base is 0 and the limit is 0. It's type codes. Blah, blah, blah. It has several flags. Yeah. It's, for example, uh, let's take another register like FS, for example. Its value is 53. DG53. You see, it has a different base. And what's the base used for? Uh, it's used for calculating the linear address. Uh, just like at just as shown on this picture. So we got segment selector, which defines a set of attributes and the base, and then we got the offset. In the pair of, for example, CSRIP, CS defines the selector and RIP defines the offset. Uh, this is where uh, the address turns into linear address. So, for example, if we or want to calculate, for example, uh, an address, for example, FS30, uh, you will have to take this base and add 30 to it. It's that simple. 
So um, it was sort of a brief exp explanation of segmentation. Yeah, because it's not the point. The point is when we got the linear address, it is still not the address that goes into like DRAM bank or something, right? It has to be turned into a physical address. And the physical address is like what goes on the address bus and what goes like into the DRAM, for example, or might be not to the DRAM as we'll see tomorrow. Uh, yeah, but still. So how do we translate an address, a virtual address, uh, into linear address and to the physical address? It goes like this. For example, here we got this one address. It is actually a shared user page address. Uh, it is, if the processor references it as this, then we have to know the base of the DS. Uh, the DS register equals to, to B, DG to B, mon B. And the base is zero. So the virtual address is equal to the linear address in this case. So we got this address, right? Uh, yes, it's right in here. There's some data. So there is a special register. Oh, actually, I'm going to show you the other picture. So we're now operating in a 64-bit uh, mode. So yeah, about that base, actually. When you operate in 64-bit uh, protected mode, the bases for segments CS, DS, uh, SS, ES are treated as zero. No, uh, no matter what is set in the segment descriptor, it's, it's just like that. If we were operating, for example, in protected mode like 32 bits, then all these uh, selectors, uh, if they had a non-zero base, they would actually hold a base which would like add to the offset. Uh, but yeah, not in this case, because of the fact that we're operating in 64-bit mode, they are treated as zero. So basically in this mode, uh, linear addresses are treated as uh, virtual addresses, except for FS and GS registers, but we'll get to that in a second. So we got the linear address and we have to turn it to the physical address. So the page map base register is CR. 3, which is control register 3. We can also look it up in WinDBG, right? DR3. And it holds a physical, not a linear, not a virtual, it holds uh, a physical address. Uh, WinDBG actually is able to uh, show us physical addresses. It uh, works like that. It works exactly like show, like this display bytes or something, right? But it starts with bang. Uh, yeah, and we say, just show us this uh, address as a physical memory. I guess I heard something in my bad question. So, did you add Alex findings on LDT in x64? Yeah, sure. They were actually pretty interesting. I, yeah, I also missed that. I didn't realize it still worked. And when I got into the experiments with this, it turned out to be that FS and GS registers which are specially treated in 64-bit mode uh, are actually aliased to the shadow part of the uh, descriptor, so to say. Um, yeah, I can actually elaborate on that in more detail, but I guess I'll try to do it in the end of the stream. You should just remind me if you wanted to. Yeah, there, there was a need. I, I also missed that fact, but yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, but still, every, everything was in the in in this thing you now. So software developer man, manual actually tells us about that. We just like missed this. So we got the uh, base of for the yeah, it's the page table base. Let's look at this picture again. So for the 64-bit virtual addresses, there are four uh, page tables. A page map level 4, page directory pointer, page directory offset, and page table offset. And then just 
an offset in a physical page. So uh, the point is that virtual memory is um, built in sort of chunks, sort of blocks, which are called the pages. The, um, so to say, standard, the pages might be different in size. Uh, in 64-bit mode, they might be like 4 kilobytes, uh, 2 megabytes, and 1 gigabyte. Yeah, depending on how many page tables you're using for mapping the virtual address into physical one, right? So, uh, yeah. And, for example, we, we took this address, right? So, I got the calculator. Oh, I already paste it. Oh, I hate the new calculator because of that, because it doesn't accept incorrect input. So, yeah, we got the virtual address. So, how it is divided? First of all, uh, in current implementations, only uh, 48. Yeah, 48 bits are used for virtual addresses. So, this set of bits is actually unused uh, while mm, while traversing the page tables, right? Uh, actually, there was a recent update to the manuals where it says that it's going to be 56 bits for virtual addresses soon, but not now. It's going to be later. So, uh, these bits are not used. And then, the virtual address is divided in uh, this matter. So the lower 12 bits are just the offset in a, in a page, right? And then we got the groups of nine. We got one, two, three, four, uh, one, and this one. So this group of nine, this group of nine. Oh, I don't see anything. This group of nine. And this. See how beautiful it is. Uh, the reason I didn't draw anything in here, it's because it's 9 bits, so it doesn't actually, uh, except for the lower part, which is 12 bits, which is kind of divided like that, uh, the other parts are somewhere in between bytes. So I prefer to use the binary view. And yeah, so the first table, if we take the first table, actually uh, what it consists of is called page table entries. It's that simple. And they're eight bytes in size, so we display words. See, we got these structures called the page table entries. Uh, we're not going to discuss uh, about what it consists of, although we might. Why not? So the relevant bits for now is the first bit, which is bit 1, uh, which says if this uh, page is actually present, or it, in terms of Windows kernel, is it valid. So if it maps anything, because you know, virtual address is not necessarily mapping anything. It could be just unmapped. So when you reference this address, a page fault occurs which means that the MMU unit, memory management unit, cannot translate this virtual address into physical one. And it like, hey, operating system, what do we do, we do about this? And there are the cases. Uh, so, yeah. Mm, what do I need to do now? I got to take the nine bits of it from, from here, right? So, one, two, three, one, two, th one, two, three, one. Three, one, two, three. So this ones. So it's not one, 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 one. Four ones, one, zero, four ones. Okay, I'll use the other calculator. So it's. Uh, oh, it doesn't matter. I can use this view. So one, 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 zero, one, 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 one. And the hexadecimal uh, number is one EF. We'll use this to find out the index of the page table entry for this virtual address in the first uh, page table. So 
or we need to do this and we got to multiply it by 8 because yeah you know the size of page table entry is 8 so we're going to evaluate this expression like that and yeah here it goes let's check this one yeah it has a valid PTE because yeah, you know it's it's the odd number so it's valid we can actually see the next page table uh, and for that the lower 12 bits actually has some meanings like whether it's user uh, uh, page or the, the kernel page was it accessed is it uh, like read protected is it valid is it cacheable and this sort of stuff there are a lot of bits meaningful in that so we just erase them these meaningful bits and we got the address yeah here goes the next page table but if we see the address which we use we can see that those groups are zeros actually right so what we have to do is to take the first page table entry in the next uh, page table right so it was the first fourth level now we got the third level we and then we got the second level And then we got the page table entry. It is already uh, a physical address uh, for this virtual address. And here are some, some bits interesting. For example, this, the highest bit, uh, actually means that this memory is not executable. I'm gonna erase that. And we got these lower bits, where, which also were like system use. And we, oh, we have to display it as physical address. Yeah, let's check this out. Here we got the virtual address and this data. And now we've traversed this virtual address uh, into a physical one. And we display bytes. Yeah, it seems to be working. Actually, there is a more efficient way in WinDBG to see the mapping of the virtual address. Uh, it's called the PD and it does everything for us it just walks through the table it show us, shows us the flags which are inside the PDEs for example this is a valid mapping this is a, oh my gosh I guess it's oh yes it's executable executable in the page table I guess it means that it it can be traversed yeah if yeah I think it goes like that so this one is writable, this one is kernel, accessed, and dirty. Accessed means that this mapping was accessed, and dirty means that it has been modified, right? And also this flag means that it is global. We'll get to that in a second. So actually, yeah, this is, it's the most difficult part, but it's also the most important part. So uh, the thing is that uh, the operating system uh, operates with virtual addresses because of the way the processor works in its protected mode. So, I got a question. So, does the MMU contain the whole memory mapping at all the time? Yeah, that's the point. It has uh, some mappings for some virtual addresses all the time. Right. But it is not necessary to, like, if you have 48 bits of virtual address spaces, this is hell a lot of uh, memory, you know, uh, way more than you can, like, afford today. So it is not necessary to map all this stuff, like, at the same time. This is actually how the virtual memory manager in the operating system system works for example uh, it well it has a small amount of physical memory right and it has a large virtual address space its uh, purpose the purpose of the operating system is uh, to like support the environment for the application uh, which um, allows this application to think uh, that it has all the memory but yeah it's not quite true right so we can uh switch the physical uh pages and repurposes 
from one process to another and for example save temporary data to the page file on the disk this is basically how the swap works right so yeah it's not necessary to map all the memory all the time yeah but if you operate with with some something it has to be it has to have a valid mapping from the virtual uh, address to the physical one so uh, I guess yeah about the TLB actually yeah this is uh, the I forgot the abbreviation look aside buffer ah, translation uh, look aside buffer right uh, it is a special type of cache which allows uh, like cache the mappings so the processor uh, doesn't walk the page tables all the time it's for example it remembers a set of virtual addresses and it and the corresponding physical addresses so it doesn't have to do the page walk on and on right so yeah there is such thing as TLB uh, thanks for the clue uh, question can you or honorary bot explain what DMA is all right uh, I guess I already mentioned that but still DMA is a special mechanism that allows a hardware to operate with system memory the thing is uh, the CPU operates with the memory right but yeah if it has to do some you know heavy stuff uh, for example like copying memory from the let's say a firewire or like whatever controller you need especially a high speed yeah but for example a firewire because it is all about DMA uh, the processor uh, has to move huge amounts of data back and forth right but yeah it's it's busy with its own business it have to, it has to do some you know number crunching for example like zipping the archives so it, it has a job to do right so uh, in order to make its life easier the DMA uh, was invented so it is the abbreviation means uh, direct memory access uh, and it's meant to be a memory direct memory access from the device and it says hey I got this chunk of data I want to copy it to the system memory without CPU let it do its own thing right so yeah and it initiates the transaction and the data from the device goes to the system memory and that's and that's about it about DMA nothing too heavy complicated if you like don't program this stuff so yeah uh, so we're speaking about the memory and yeah let's get to the virtual address space uh, there is an extension in WinDBG which is called bang address and currently I'm using the kernel debugger right so it's mostly about the kernel it will show us the kernel memory map and here's the thing about uh, how modern operating system work uh, I gonna open the Wikipedia so about this thing so the current implementation is 48-bit uh, virtual addresses right and it works like that there is something like a lot of terabytes and it, there is this part which is also a lot of terabytes and in between there is a space which is called non-canonical addresses yeah so they invented a rule uh, which goes like this so we got 84 bits usable right and the rule is pretty simple if the highest available bit is one then all the bits past it have to be one and if it's zero all the bits have to be zero as simple as that if uh, it's not like that the translation is not going to work actually it will uh, show us a GP which is general protection fault so yeah that's and it works like this like this small island and this small island they are small compared to this whole right so 
and the modern operating system uh, do the following. They use this lower part or of virtual virtual address uh, addresses available as the user mode uh, address space, and the upper one is for the kernel mode address space. So all the programs in user mode uh, have this much bytes of virtual memory available, available, and this one for the kernel. So I guess yeah. We got the kernel memory map, which is pretty huge, yeah, because of, uh, because there are a lot of uh, entries which are pretty much similar. But first, as we speak about the user mode, I'd like to exactly eighty six, I guess. Yeah, I'd like to open the user mode program workspace in just a second. Reload the symbols do my favorite com comment which is clear screen and bang address oh just a second i'm gonna change the font because it is ugly right now yep so here we have a virtual address space of a user mode application yeah so my pro my approach uh includes the following uh, when I gain the execution somewhere, I have to understand of, uh, what's, what's around, you know. So where am I now? What are those addresses where they belong? And what are those addresses where they belong? So I don't want to get lost in these uh, addresses, right? So that's why I actually show, I'm showing the, the, this. So... It starts with zero, actually. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. And I guess it was WinDBG. Oh no, it was 80 plus. It was x86 or x64. I don't remember. Yeah, but it doesn't really matter. So, and it shows us the region size. So it says from here to here, the state of memory is free. So nothing is mapped there. If you walk the if you could walk the page table right here, there were like nothing. So the page table entry at some point would show us that it's not valid. So there's no mapping. And if you like reference this address, it will give us a page fault, right? So which eventually turns inside the Windows kernel into, for example, access violation. Yeah. So the next region is actually, well, I didn't expect to, to it so early, but still, it's the user sh shared data. It's a notice noticeable uh, page, actually, because it, is ha it has the same virtual address among, among all the processes uh, on Windows. Yeah, we have this uh, thing like, uh, address space layout randomization but it doesn't touch this one because it is supposed to be there all the time and there is an interesting structure I guess I'm going to show you this one in in here uh, it is basically also present in a kernel space I will find it in just a second uh, oh yeah it's actually this address Go, I need to find it in here. So it's all Fs. All Fs. Where are the all Fs? And the 7. Yeah. Just, just a second. Uh, where are you? Ah, yeah. It's the system shared page. So it's the kernel page, which is mapped as read only page in all user mode uh, processes. So it has this. Uh, kernel virtual address which doesn't change and this user mode uh, address which doesn't change and there you know there's a lot of interesting stuff in there so we have to display type and see user shared data shared data and map it to this address and as you see while it has no useful information for exploitation because it has no kernel pointers or something 
it has some sort of interesting stuff for example the address of NT system which is C windows in my case right so image number which tells us that it's x64 bit image right so large page minimum is yeah it's for this it's two megabytes for this platform and GC and some limitations of, of or virtual address space which is applied for 32 bits applications mm, yeah it has also an NT major version and an NT minor version and yeah if you got this API which is uh, how's that called get Windows get version I guess or yeah which tells us the version of Windows uh, you might uh, remember that it doesn't work properly on Windows 10 because it will show you 6.3 uh, I guess oh, well the way to work this around is to use the NT major and minor version which comes from the user shared page for example yeah also there is an interesting flag which means hey the KD debugger enabled so you're under the kernel debug now and you understand that so every process actually knows that it is being debugged not just debugged as we might look up in the PEB uh, process environment block but yeah it has also knowledge about it's being debugged with the kernel debugger uh, yeah it is sort of anti-debugging trick based stuff so some policies what I'm actually looking for is yeah tick count and there is a system timer which ticks which is used for, for scheduling and if you like disassemble its handler the interrupt handler for the system timer it has like it directly increments this field since yeah the user share, shared data is uh, always in the same virtual address it just yeah increments this value right in here so yeah um, some extended states yeah so there are some interesting stuff which is available even from the user mode but yeah we see it is read only it is supposed to be read only because it's a kernel page uh, in origin so let's get to the next range so it's free no access unknown and private oh it's some private memory which is unknown to the debugger which is surprising because debugger uh, yeah mostly it knows about the region it operates in yeah so we got this thing which is called PEB which is process environment block so it's a special uh, region of memory that holds the information oh it's in TDLL I guess about the current process so you might also observe this one and yeah here's our favorite flag it says that it is being debugged yeah we can actually map this one we got the extension bank PB yeah it displays in its own flavor but yeah we only need its address so we're going to map with this one like this process environment block and yeah hmm being debugged interesting maybe it's because it's launched under the WinDBG right so yeah uh, image base address uh, which is pretty much interesting for this one and we got LDR this is actually w w the loader database because it holds the database of the of all the modules that are loaded loaded in this uh, process so we got process parameters and some locks and system stuff global flags yeah so you might also observe this one. Oh, it also has like OS major and minor version which I guess the correct values uh, yeah so let's go to the next range so process environment block is one per process which is obvious right uh, and, but yeah we also have structures that are called TEB which is thread environment blocks and there may be several thread environment blocks it's basically one per thread yeah and if you have like 
heavily multi-threaded applications um, with many threads there will be like one db for every thread so we got this address Let's, we also might look the contents of this one with db and this mapping so it has all sorts of stuff there are like for this current thread so environment pointer blah 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 yeah so yeah you can also check this out the next one next one is the stat it is also an attribute of a thread uh, and it is actually the place where our RSP register is an initialized yeah this is just a region of memory that is used for the stack and then also we have a sets of regions which have the PE image inside yeah it is where it's mapped fixed and executed also the code which is executed is generally uh, from the images right so it has to be uh, somewhere right there you can actually see that um, you know that PE files have several sections and these uh, sections are uh, actually mapped as different regions of memory because they utilize different protection constants for example uh, yeah so that's it and also we got a heap so when you first initialize the process the, there is a default heap uh, I'm sorry about this clumsy like so we got this heap address but yeah actually I've scrolled through the process environment block and it actually has a list of heaps inside it uh, let's take a look so yeah uh, heap 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 segment commit uh, yeah for example yeah number of heaps maximum number of heaps and this one process heaps yeah you can use the API which is heap create uh, for creating several heaps in the process yeah because heaps have different attributes like low fragmentation heap for example and you can utilize separate heaps for separate purposes yeah so this is where our dyna dynamic allocations come from so the other region is api set map which is used for looking up the correct version of the dll for this certain program yeah because of uh backward compatibility or some sort of stuff uh system default activation data and activation context data is used like for comma objects yeah so this is it goes for this yeah uh, we may see that this process actually has several hits so yeah there's several hits and we also may have different mapped files yeah but one map file will there will be there for sure it's the NLS so NLS stands for a national language system and it is used to uh, for translating from NC or whatever code page you use to Unicode uh, or maybe in the opposite direction yeah and this uh, conversion mappings are stored in this files which is initialized during the boot process it has a valid kernel mapping yeah it is also mapped as read only since its origin is the kernel yeah and it is mapped into all the processes uh yeah so we also have some chunks of page file so there goes the different modules uh, which are basically the dlls that are used and then we have uh, the region which is no access so about this zero address uh, back in the days of Windows 7 until some patch uh, I'm not sure which one but yeah there was a possibility to allocate the virtual address at zero there's a special system call was used for it it was like G allocate virtual memory memory well, allocate mem what do i write memory yeah it's, it's there so it's a system call used to use for a virtual memory manager 
yeah, uh, which allocated the memory. So, scroll up. Yeah, you could actu actually allocate this, and this was used for exploiting the kernel mode drivers. Yeah, uh, the ex exceptions or vulnerabilities which were null pointer the reference. So, yeah, they use the null pointer, but yeah, we turn this null pointer into a valid pointer. We like fake the data or something. Yeah, it was reused, and bang, we got local privilege es escalation. Uh, yeah, but nowadays you can actually do that. Uh, so, I guess that's about it about like user mode virtual address space. Uh, and we can continue and proceed to the kernel mappings, which is bang address again. Well, so because of the kernel mode debugging, it actually says, yeah, you got this user range and yeah, you got this system shared page, which is k user shared, shared data. And then you have the user range, and I don't care what's inside it. It's just the user range. No one cares. I'm a kernel mode debugger, right? So, uh, user probe area, uh, uh, it, yeah, it goes from this to this. I'm not sure why it's like that. Yeah, it's some, like, system purpose. I'm not sure. It's like, I didn't notice it before. Yeah, but still, uh, here we see this range of the addresses, and this is exactly that non-addressable uh, address space, which is non-canonical, and the address map knows, has to know about it, so any reference to this one uh, goes straight to invalid mapping, right? So, uh, I got a question, why does the kernel see the kernel range? Yeah, that's the tricky one. Mm, but yeah, we're gonna have to get back to the segmentation stuff. All right, no problem. So, uh, uh, oh, user range. Why does the kernel see? Well, it's it's no different. It's actually it doesn't matter. Uh, the mechanism is basically the same. So, uh, as I said before. The instructions are being executed at this one, at, at this one, right? So we got CS, and it is currently uh, this one, right? So I'm gonna use this one. EG, so it has a base zero, limit zero, because basically those fields are ignored in x86 mode. So the type code, blah, 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 and flags, where the RPL. Um, yes. Oh, no, 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 no. It's fine. So, the thing that matters is that selector is uh, consists of several bits. Yeah, in just a second. I'm going to look it up uh, to show you the picture. So, it's a protected memory mode management and using segments. Basic flat model, blah, blah, blah. In just a second to see you the format of this segment selector and it goes like this so basically the first bits of this value are this one so rpl is requested privilege level you may see that two bits are utilized uh yeah because there are several protection rings uh, on the info platform which goes from zero to three but modern operating systems utilize only Ring 0, which is the most privileged one, and ring 3, which is less privileged one. Ring 3 for user mode application, ring 0 for kernel mode, uh, right? And we got this table indi indicator, yeah, and it sends us back to the Alexia and Esco with this LDT stuff. It just basically says where to get to this, the descriptor from GDTR register, which points to GDT, or to local descriptor table, which, yeah, may which is pointed from GDT to some address in linear space. Yeah, and there are the segments. Uh, yeah, just forget about this. And there, this is the index which tells us the offset uh, in the descriptor table, which we have to do. 
we, which we have to take. But yeah, but now uh, those two bits are relevant for now. So we see that this uh, number is actually or or oh, what's wrong with me? Formats. So binary. We see the lowest two bits are zero. It means that we execute code with uh, zero privilege in CPL zero, in ring zero, which is the most privileged one. Yeah, and because we're now in kernel. Yeah, I've stopped in the kernel. For example, if you take this one, uh, we see that lower bits are one one, which is three, and it says that it has a ring three privilege. If you fetch, fetch some data using this register, it, it is going to be like user mode access. And yeah, this, that's about the segmentation. And now we're gonna get back to the PTE. And if we take, for example, this address, which is pretty much kernel one, we see that actually it is, uh, it's a large page, so we cannot actually see it in here. Uh, let's try this one. Yeah, it, yeah, that's an issue of WinDBG because if it uses the large page, actually, uh, yeah, wait a second. It actually shows us that it's a kernel address. But yeah, to make just to make sure, uh, you see the PTE has a bit in a like. Remember the page table entry. It's eight byte in length, and the least uh, twelve uh, bits are describing these flags, this set of flags, right? And one of those says if its page is user mode or kernel mode. So it's user supervisor in terms of uh, Intel document Intel's documentation. So actually, this page is a kernel mode page. Yeah, but if we try any user mode address, uh, but for that, I'm going to have to switch to the user mode process because I'm in the context of system process right now. Oh, trusted installer. Look at that. It's installing Windows Update without like my permission. Such a bad guy. So process interactive, go. Reload. Let's try, I don't know, for example, uh, list modules. That was a command that lists the modules. And yeah, let's try this address, for example. Is it readable? Yes, it's readable. So it's being mapped, actually. So we do this bank PTE, and we see that, oh, sorry. Instead of kernel, it's a user mode page. And here's the comes, like, the bottom line of it. When you execute at CPL, which equals to zero, you're in a supervisor mode. And yet you can see both kernel and uh, user mode pages. But if you operate at CPL, which is equals to three, which is a user mode, only user mode pages are accessible for you, right? Otherwise you get a page fold again. Yeah, and you will see nothing basically. Uh, so I hope I answered the question. So where was I? Let me just remember this one. So I was uh, speaking about about what about mappings. All right, I don't remember, but that doesn't matter. I do the bank address. Oh yeah, I was was looking at the kernel address map basically. So it's mapping system cache regions, which is pretty huge and you'll see why in just a second mom what makes you so busy can you see this guy yes well i'm busy don't touch me i hope it, it is oh no everything's fine it just takes too much time so uh oh it Look at that, it has actually mapped some uh, user mode range because I've loaded the symbols for this process. Yeah, sweet. It has mapped P, 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 B, and so on. So this whole is uh, non-canonical addresses, which I showed you before. So here it starts the system range. And here we got the, the huge uh, region, which is uh, used for system caches. 
And this extension actually shows us uh, which exactly system cache it holds. I guess it holds 228 kilobyte, kilobytes of data, which is actually a part of some file. And we can see that, yeah, this is an attribute for some file. Uh, I mean, a directory, as, as you may see here, it has uh, um, mapped MFT mirror. Yeah, this sort of stuff is used for NTFS uh, file system. So there are huge uh, of volumes of data which are mapped from the uh, your hard drive to the memory, which is used for cache for faster loading, but not only for faster loading. For example, the um, yeah, there is a read ahead feature which. Uh, uh, reads the data from the disk asynchronously while you use the like read file function. There is also uh, uh, an inverted mechanism which uh, is lazy write when you do some write file API it just writes it to the memory and then there is a worker thread that flushes this memory uh, back to the file system on your hard drive. Yeah, so you can see there is a huge uh, set of files being mapped. Yeah, so system cache is used pretty much extensively and Yeah, it occupies a lot of records So yeah, we're just gonna have to scroll it down so um, Come on Is there an end to it? I mean, I know it is but I guess it is more efficient to just scroll it like this. Yeah. Can you imagine that? I would have scrolled it for years. But still. So, here we go. Here we got the next region, which is actually a region that, that is called in Windows Internals book as System PTE, uh, which is System Mappings. And basically, yeah, uh, we have uh, stacks which are utilized for kernel mode threads. So they're just regular threads, but the, but uh, they reside they reside in the kernel space. So yeah, there are a lot of worker threads, you know, doing its own stuff. Uh, what I want to show you that they're rather small. They're like six pages. So yeah, so recursion is not uh, recommended when you right drivers yeah because there's not enough stack memory in kernel yeah and there's a reason for that for that i forgot to say you but uh but it's important the kernel space where's my picture i guess i closed this one i'm gonna show you in just a second um where's my google yeah, here it is. So, uh, while this region is a kernel one, and the kernel is just a single ton, you know, it's sort of entity that is one for everyone, it is always there and is always the same. While the lowest part, which represents the user mode process, is switched all the time it is uh, private to each uh, process so when the process is switched yeah the page table address is switched so register CR3 is reloaded to point somewhere else uh, somewhere and this somewhere else which is a page table for sure uh, describes the same kernel mode region but different user space region so this is basically how you separate the address spaces between the processes so each process has its own address space yeah it works like that um, gonna just... yeah and so while you can spam the user mode threads all over the place in the user mode process and you can do a lot of user mode processes the, there is not enough room for lots of stacks in kernel space yeah because they share the address space and yeah that's basically why it is so small 
So yeah, we got this thread which is belonging to this process. So yeah, and there are also a lot of stacks which we skip also. And then a humble set of regions which are actually important. So it is also the system range which is used for system mappings, right? But yeah, here we have page tables and it's the place where the page tables are mapped into virtual spaces. You remember that virtual, oh, oh, oh I mean, <laughs> remember that page tables actually use physical addresses, right? But yeah, how do you manage them if they are not mapped? So there are special page table entry, entries which are self-mapped. And we can like try to PTE it like that. And we see, yeah, basically that PTE for this address resides on this virtual address. So like you can, this is actually how you set up mappings. Because, yeah, you know, your processor works in a virtual uh, address mode, right? So it has to have virtual address to modify the mappings. Yeah. And that's basically the place there where they live. Yeah, so it's like, oh, where is it? So, you know, we skip that one. The driver spam, spam, spam all the place. Yeah, so the page table resides res, reside in this region. So the hyperspace is a special space. Yeah, it, it is actually where you, you travel uh, with the speed uh, that is beyond the speed of light. Yeah, but it's not the case for Windows because it is basically the space uh, which is used for describing the system working set. The si uh, not, not the system, but the, yeah, I'm just reading ahead. Uh, the working set of a process. Uh, what is working set of the process? Well, it is a um, set of pages that are physically resident, which, uh, ha which have a valid mapping. So with this mechanism, you keep track of uh, how much memory a process actually consumes, right? So this hyperspace is for that. Uh, yeah. And then we got this system shared page that we already seen before. So there's also a system cache working set, uh, which resides in this region, right? And then we have a list of actually drivers, which are also PE images, which are also just modules, and they're just mapped right in here. And here is, is the list of the drivers that are loaded into the kernel address space right now. So yeah, we can list them. Uh, yep. So there's uh, also a range of system PEs, which is used for uh, system mappings. Yeah. And we have this like paged pool. I don't see a non-paged pool. It must have been lost somewhere. Yeah, but yeah, let's just finish this one and I'll get you to the another um, like more precise picture. Uh, but still, yeah. So we got the paged pool. What is paged pool? It's it's first of all, it's a pool. And the pool is a synonym uh, for heap. So in user mode, you have a region of memory that you can dynamically allocate. Uh, and it's called a heap. So it's the same thing, but for kernel mode. So it's the region where you can al dynamically allocate in free memory. So it is called a pool. It has somewhat the same uh, internal structure as the user mode heap. Yeah, but not really. So they have something in common. They're a little different, but still. Uh, yeah, it, the, the pool resembles the heap in a certain way. Uh, it is called the page pool because the pages from this pool actually can be swapped to the disk. There is also a non-paged pool, which I have missed or which is not shown here. Uh, and it's a pool with the uh, memory that will never be swapped, right? So there are certain circumstances in kernel when you can, oh yeah, it's a simple 
uh, example, for example, your kernel image, your kernel executable has to reside in non-paged pool, for example, because yeah, the code that will swap in the pages from the hard drive back into memory is actually located in the in this kernel. So how would it like swap it back itself? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. So. And we have also the session space, and this is uh, a tricky one. This is actually an exception to the rule which uh, I said before about the kernel that it is all the same for all the processes. This region, uh, which is session space, uh, is used for Windows graphics subsystem, not only Windows graphics subsystem, but also like uh, when you have different users on your computer, it has a separate session. So uh, this is uh, what it's used for. Actually, there is this well-known Win32K driver, which is a graphic uh, subsystem in Windows kernel. Uh, this is a terminal services DLL, canonical display driver. Yeah, it's all the things which are needed to be separated for different users. Because, you know, if you use a server version of Windows where different users may work at the same time. This is uh, the place where you have to separate this one. Uh, yeah, so basically what I'm saying, this region of memory uh, this one, is different, has different mapping for different sessions. So for different users, uh, the session spaces will be different. So yeah. And here it goes the PFN database, and it's also a very noticeable place, you know, because it is the place where the physical pages are described. So the physical pages uh, is a resource in terms of operating system, so it keeps track of using the physical uh, pages, right? So, and this is a sort of database which keeps track of what uh, physical uh, page frame uh, is used in the moment, at the moment, right? So, yeah, this is the place where they store. We got this strange system range. Yeah, but we'll get to that in a second. And here we have an hardware abstraction la uh, layer. It's uh, a special region for all DLL which is used for separating the hardware uh, from the kernel logic, you know, yeah, because Windows actually can run on different architectures. So it's, uh, yeah, achieved by using this hardware abstraction layer. And it has its own heap. Yeah, which is, I, I, yeah, I guess it's resident, resident all the time. So it's sort of non-paged memory. Yeah, but what I was going to show you is, um, excerpt from the article by Alexey Onesko. He actually wrote about how control flow guard that was implemented on Windows 8.9 changed the address space. Yeah, so the point is uh, there is sort of another memory map which is uh, an extended version of memory map that you may find in Windows internals book, right? So I guess there are some regions that we were not discussing. So unused space, uh, uh, space memory hall. So the system cache, we've seen it. It starts with B, basically. Yeah, but I'm saying that it starts with B because we're talking about Windows 8.9. Uh, yeah. It might change in different versions, for example, for Windows 10. Because, yeah, you know, we used to have this PDE space, which uh, w w is where the page tables reside in kernel, and they're they are now dynamically relocated. So each time the kernel loads, it has a different address. Yeah, um, I'm not sure about the system cache, but yeah, it may change. So. The system K, uh, cache, the page pool, which we're discussing, so the system PTEs, 
uh, yeah, here it is, the non-paged pool, it's the region of addresses, which uh, may be used for dynamic memory allocations, which are not going to be swapped. So new space, PDE space, yeah, where the page table reside in virtual address space. So the hyperspace is the region where the working set is, shared user data, of course. System uh, PTE working set. So yeah, there is also a region that tracks uh, the working set of the kernel, right? So there is a hash table that is used uh, to look up the working sets. Um, I mean, if you if you look into the PFM that database, some bits of it will have the hash that will represent uh, the hash of a working set. So you like may correspond the physical uh, BFM uh, with the working set which it belongs to. So yeah, page pool working set I guess. Uh, so it's again hash table, system cache working set. So yeah, yeah, there are a lot of working sets. Yeah, because the kernel needs to keep the track of the physical memory usage, right? So system view, session space which is different. So, yeah, the PFN database and the HAL heap. So, basically, basically, that's it. That's all you can, like, find in Windows, both in user mode and kernel mode. Uh, and, you know, about, yeah, about a note about uh, reverse engineering the Windows. So, it is it also concerns uh, my own approach and it goes like this uh, I'd rather like read the Windows internal book and uh, understand uh, how things like work there in in a conceptual uh, point of view right so I used to like many years ago when I was into reverse engineering the kernel I used to memorize the things, oh, so there is this struct and it has this field. And soon I realized that this approach works, but yeah, for a brief period, for a short period of time, because, you know, the kernel is a live su substance and it changes all the time. So you don't have to remember everything. And if you are interested in the implementation, yeah, which is the details of how the things work in the operating system. You, you should better have like the idea in the conceptual a way of what's going on inside, and then to like it's the starting point for your reverse engineering the current implementation. Yeah, and the fun story about that is the mistake which I actually made in the past stream when I was looking the process list right yeah so what i'm talking about is that i remember that uh the processes in windows are organized as a list so i remember that has to be a variable that represents the head of this list so what i did is that is i type uh, process list and it says, oh yeah, you got this uh, variable, which is process list hat. And then, it's the thing that I actually memorized. If you look into the eProcess structure, uh, I, I was searching for active, active process list, right? Where is that? Active process links. So yeah, I, I like remember that there is a variable that represents the list and I remember that the links are active process links. But yeah, but then I realized that there are different lists. Uh, and actually, for, in order to use active process links, you need a different variable, which is ds active, I guess it's, oh. Yeah, and yeah, the fun stuff about this this one is that it doesn't contain a word list. This is why I 
I forgot this one. So the difference about those lists are actually that this one is from the PS subsystem, which uh, is responsible for process objects. Yeah, and basically every process that is created on Windows is placed into this list. And the other list that I first found, which is internal, internal, is this kernel internal process list head. Uh, if you look up the links which are used for this list, you may find that they reside in this field, which is PCB, which is K process. If you see something starting from the K, you may uh, like realize that this is actually a um, structure that is used for the dispatcher, for the scheduler. Uh, so it's thing that is used for scheduling. So yeah, and this process list head is like a schedule, scheduler variable because it holds not all the processes. It holds only the processes that have active threads in it. Yeah because scheduling on Windows is thread-based. So, yeah, basically, it's, it's the way that I reverse engineer Windows. But yeah, it may be a failure sometimes, but yeah, because of the confusion. Still, the most common like, approach is searching for certain variables and look them up in here. So, uh, I guess I've uh, told everything about virtual address spaces what I wanted. I hope uh, it was like somewhat clear to you. If you want me to pay attention on some region or for some place of the kernel more, uh, you should really ask it as a question or like something. Yeah because I'm not sure what you guys are interested in, so I like tell you the most basic stuff. Yeah, but I am ready to answer your questions. And also, I remember that one of you guys actually asked me to tell you about the DPC and IRQL about window, on, on Windows. Uh, yeah, so I will tell you this, as I promised. So, the concept of IRQL is uh, like that. So there are different interrupts that may occur on Windows, right? Uh, it is actually not Windows specific. It's hardware specific. Yeah, but in terms of Windows, there is such thing as an interrupt. It's an asynchronous event that may like interrupt your execution at, at any given time. So, uh, I'm not going to lie, uh, but I think there is no such thing as IRQ, IRQL on Linux. You can well correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, but yeah, on Windows, the interrupts I prioritized. So every interrupt, uh, let's just take a look. There's an extension that uh, is called Bang IDT, which shows us an interrupt descriptor table, but also the interrupt uh, service routines that are bound to it so these are the exceptions but yeah here we have like usb port which is uh, it's not the iq it's the idt idt vector so it's usb port usb exits high audio uh, so yeah you see that there are many sources of interrupts and they are prioritized uh, on Windows. So when you connect the interrupt uh, object with the with your driver, when you uh, write an interrupt service routine for that, you actually specify this thing which is called an IRQL, which basically means the priority of uh, the corresponding interrupt. So, but it not not it is not all only used for uh, interrupt priority prioritization it is also used uh, for threat priority prior prior priority so uh, so priority zero is uh, called IRQL which is passive level it is level zero where all the threads run uh, then we have an APC level which is one uh, and this is um, 
a priority level uh, used for APC, which is asynchronous procedure procedure call. They, those are actually uh, thread specific. So this IRKL is thread specific because APC are bound to the threads. So this is sort of like uh, events. It is somewhat uh, there are there are like signals on Linux because, for example. There is a special APC to suspend the process or to terminate this process. So it, uh, it interrupts the uh, thread that is run running on a passive level and does some stuff. So as you see, uh, it has a higher priority. So that's the reason it interrupts the passive level. Yeah, and then we have a DPC level, which you asked for. So Actually, it's, uh, it is also not related to hardware interrupts or something. It is used for scheduling. So it is basically the event where the scheduler works. And the scheduler is basically switching the threads or something like that. And it is actually a higher level than this one and this one. So this may interrupt this ones. Right, I'm I'm going to check out the mumble just in a second. So there are different questions, and I'll I'll get to them. So those are uh, so to speak the levels the of the events that can interrupt the normal execution of a thread, uh, and they're the part of Windows architecture. But then we have uh, DIRQL, which is device IRQL, and those are actually like uh, this ones. So they are designed per a device. So when device has higher priority, it meant it may overtake uh, the interrupt that is being processed at the moment on the lower level. So the rule is simple. If you are a uh, higher level interrupt, you may interrupt the current execution. If you are lower or equal, you just wait for a turn. And yeah, some details of, on implementations about that is that on x86 system, systems, you have just a variable uh, that is actually an attribute of a core. Yeah, because IRKLs are bound to the processor cores. So different cores, cores might have different IRQLs. Let's just see. There is a bank IRQL command in WinDBG to see the current IRQL. So it's low level. So basically, uh, I guess we're executing in some program or in kernel mode thread. Yeah, on the low level. So it is not dispatcher or something. But yeah, we can check out different cores. So IRQL. Is also low level, also low level, so they are all low level. Oh no, you see the core, which is the third one, is currently at dispatch level. And why? Let's see that. Where are we now? Load in order to find out why it is this dispatch level. In just a second. Um, um, um. The mumble. So yeah, I'm gonna speed the things up, I guess. Uh, yeah, and the implementation uh, detail about the x64 platform is there a sub special register added for uh, long mode, which is CR8, or which holds the current uh, interrupt priority. So it's TPL, uh, red priority level, I guess. So, sort of like that. And actually, if you see what's inside there, it is F. So it is actually high level. So um, yeah, it is because of the kernel mode debugger running. It is running with interrupts suppressed. Yeah, because it has to be like in a tight loop. So if you like, uh, see the direct the immediate value of cr8 it is high level which is f yeah but the saved irq irq level 
which is what it was before the kernel debugger were broken was like the dispatch level. So yeah, basically it's like that. It's just the way the execution preempts a different execution unit. So yeah. I'm going to proceed to the other question. How does physical address extension work? Yeah, this is sort of thing which is used for 32-bit uh, paging. You see, if you uh, open the chapter 4 of uh, the volume 3 of Intel Software Developer's Manual, there are different modes of paging. So basic 32-bit paging uh, utilizes two levels of, of uh, page tables. So see so three points to uh, page level 1, then page level 2, and then the PFM. So there is a limitation for this one. We can address only 32 bits, right? So that's the reason why physical address extensions were invented, so to, so to say. Uh, and it uses a different, um, how to say, so it utilizes different number of bits in the virtual address and it adds a top level directory pointer. So you can have additional directory pointers where you may look up the page table entries. And with this uh, sort of stuff, you can address up to 60, oh, not 60, but 36 bits. So this is basically how it works. It's just different uh, page table structure and different uh, virtual address layout. So, yeah. Uh, I guess in the context of using more than 4 gigs of memory in 32-bit address space. Uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> it was actually a different question, but still. Uh, you can address more than uh, 4 gigs of physical memory, physical, but your virtual address space is still limited to 32 bits. So you can have like two or three user mode gigs, uh, depending on settings on your 32-bit operating system, right? Yeah, but in order to use more than uh, this, let's say more than two or three gigs, there is a special uh, API set on Windows which is called Address Windows Extensions. And it works like, like that. You just allocate the window which is going to map different physical addresses. So you can have more memory, but you use only like this small window to look through it. So you just remap it all the time. So here you have it. It is called window, address window in extensions. So you can read about this, that in here. So there is no magic. Your virtual address space remains 32 bit in length. So I think you went over this, but can you force a process to run at uh, ring level zero? Well, uh, let's say it like that. Your process eventually calls a system call, uh, which is something which resides in the kernel. And this is actually where your user mode thread turns into kernel mode thread, but you are still in the address space of the process you are currently in. So your process actually runs at CPL zero, but yeah, it runs a kernel code. It runs uh, some sort of system call. But if you're guessing, if you're saying that you'd like to execute your own code at CPL zero, then yeah, you either have to write your own driver or to find some exploitable bug in Windows and like do the local privilege escalation. Yeah. So is the kernel having mappings of user process memory area a security problem? Uh, I'm sorry, is the kernel having mappings of user memory area a security problem? You mentioned no point on the reference, but can a kernel exploit uh, can use the use other user memory uh, resources during exploitation too, right? Is there a way to make this hard? A brilliant question indeed. So, yeah, even when you do some sort of system call, 
uh, the kernel needs a data that it will uh, like it will serve as an input, right? Because if you need to open the file, you have to specify its file name. So the user parameters actually are being passed into the kernel all the time. And there are different ways to do it. You can buffer it, so copy in the separate kernel buffer, or you can use just the user mode mapping. So the kernel actually has the access to user mode pages, right? So we can actually read the data from the user space uh, directly. But yeah, it might be a security issue, especially for the buggy software. For example, yeah, there's actually a very cool series by Mateusz Jurczyk, which uh, uh, wrote about uh, double fetches that, yeah, together with Kinwai, they made uh, available with box bound. Yeah, and there's a very cool article about that, on how to exploit this. Um, the principle is, uh, while kernel does the checks, uh, you may uh, race into changing the data. Oh, I remember that there was actually a stream about that, right? So yeah, when you handle the user mode data from the kernel mode, yeah, you have to be super careful about this. Yeah, it might be a security issue. Yeah, but kernel exploit may utilize any sort of user mode memory, and especially for that, as super technology by Intel was invented, which is called... Oh, don't Google it, please. Google it only as SMEP Intel. Otherwise, yeah, it will be... Okay, so it is... I'm trying to build... Ah. I'm just going to look at in this. So the control registers, the control register CR4 has this bit. Where is it? Oh, yeah, here it is. So SMEP, which stands for Supervisor Mode Execution Prevention. So when you run at CPL0, uh, you may not run from the user page. I've shown you on in the PTE that it has attribute if it's kernel or user page. So if you jump into user page to execute some code, then a page fall will occur. Yeah, also there is a technology which is SME, SMAP, which prevents the access to user mode pages. But this one is not utilized by Windows, yeah, because it touches users, user memory all the time. Uh, but yeah, I know that Linux utilizes it. So yeah, there are technology and mitigations for it. Uh, available starting uh, with Ivy Bridge for SMAP and Haswell for SMAP. I mean, not Haswell, but Broadwell. Yeah, Broadwell has SMAP. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, uh, perhaps this has been asked, but what does Tom usually find himself doing while in the kernel? I want to understand how this thing this applies to his daily job of tasks. Well, it is sort of a secret, but I, yeah, I do a lot of reverse engineering, especially in Windows kernel, because... Um, Gin, could you just say me if I can make a small advertise of myself on your stream? <laughs> can I say about my tool, which I'm developing? Yep, no. But yeah, I'll be waiting for the answer uh, for the answer of Kinwa. Oh, he says, sure. So yeah, let's go to the GitHub actually. And there is a thing which is called PulseDBG. It's uh, my own debugger that I actually developed in my spare time. So it's a hypervisor based debugger tool. And yeah, in order to so the hypervisor sees only raw bytes of physical memory. And in order to understand what those bytes are, I have to like make it up into some something that makes a logical sense. For example, uh, how I detect the kernel. It is somehow wired to the hardware, which I something I know from reverse engineering. Uh, for example, we have a special model specific register register which holds the address of a dispatcher table for syscalls 
and this is the place where I can look around and find the Windows kernel. Once I find the Windows kernel, for example, I can actually uh, like parse this data and uh, operate as this one, as WinDBG, for example. This is the part where I reverse engineering how it corresponds with its hardware. Yeah, I might be doing a little demo, some, some uh, later, I guess. But yeah, it's the example. Yeah, but it's also good, I guess, for malware re researching, being able to like understand what's going on in the operating system. So, um, yeah, uh, but if those IRQ levels are kernel concept, how can anyone interrupt anyone there? Uh, that's the point. It's the kernel which interrupts everyone. Yeah. Uh, so from user mode, uh, I don't remember for now if there are any means for from making like an artificial situation where you uh, force the some interrupt, you know. But yeah, let's let's just say I. I'm not aware for now by, uh, of any means that you can interrupt the execution well, uh, from the user mode. So yeah, it, the kernel and the hardware does that. And the kernel does it all the time. It loves DPCs. It, yeah, a lot of call being executed in, you know, in this DPC level. There are special object DPCs, yeah, but it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, what is dispatch level? Uh, yeah, I've been talking about it for a while. What are APCs and what does it mean when my driver causes a PSAW due to an APC state index mismatch? Uh, yeah, APCs are asynchronous procedure calls. So it's something that can interrupt the normal execution of your trap. You know, there's no such thing as signals in, on Windows, right? But yeah, this is some sort of stuff that is uh, something like that, but it works in a different way. So you may put your thread into a sleep using the function sleep x. Oh no, doesn't matter. Sleep x, and uh, it will put your thread into a lot of alertable state. So it's either going to wait uh, for the object. Uh, or for the time period you specified in sleep X or for the APC which you can queue for the from the user mode using the function queue user APC this one so it says I want to send an APC to this thread with this procedure and it will send and if the thread was in the alertable state it will wake up and execute this procedure this is actually how the hijacks uh, work in windows also because yeah when the thread is starting you may inject an apc into it so i hope i answered your questions oh yeah about that thought apc state index mismatch means that uh, from my experience uh, most of the times when it happens is when you have attached to a different process and you forgot to uh, deattach from it or yeah it is it has something to do with the attachment of the process the attach process actually changes the current uh, address space which is re reloading the CR3 register which we've been talking about on the stream so yeah you might forgot to attach or deattach from a different process because yeah an APC state is modif modified in this moment yeah but yeah they, there might be different reasons for that but from my experience it's the most frequent one can anyone get past the driver signing um, on Windows x64 I guess not uh, unless you find an exploitable vulnerability which is going to be like local privilege escalation or 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 might be yeah if you have administrative privileges i guess there are some ways to bypass that 
Yeah, but that would be also vulnerabilities. And the other way is what uh, developers use is actually do the test designing and uh, boot in a debugging mode, which allows you uh, not to load the driver signature. This is how you can actually experiment with your own kernel mode drivers. So next question, how do you reverse undocumented Windows driver functions efficiently without symbols? Without symbols? Efficiently? Well, it's a tough one actually, but yeah. Uh, if you don't have symbols, I, get, I would recommend following the calls that are that you know actually so there has to be something you already know both like from the driver you reverse engineer right now or from the environment so yeah uh i guess it's something like that so it's general general purpose reverse engineering of course when i talk about reverse engineering windows i always use the symbols because yeah why not they are there do this magic so yeah plus one for demo of your debugger plus one that too maybe tomorrow you will have to sometimes okay i will show you it tomorrow i will set the things up yeah because uh, today i'm not prepared for that so yep i guess that's it for the day and tomorrow we are going to discuss the physical address space because yeah it has some interesting stuff in there it's not only just you know your dram banks or something yeah there is a lot of interesting things i will also do a small demo of my debugger and thanks for coming i had a great time you too and see you tomorrow bye Okay, unmuted. Now it's better. Thank you very much, Artem, for for doing the stream. I really enjoyed it as usual, and I learned a few tricks as well. So it was productive time for me. Um, and I really hope you're going to show your debugger tomorrow as well, since I'm quite quite interested in in hypervisor mode debuggers. That's actually a really cool topic as well. Cool. So um, if you enjoyed today, you should totally be here tomorrow because there will be the fourth and the last part of Honorary Bot's series on Windows kernel debugging. Apart from that, uh, Mormus CTF is going to start his stream like just after the stream ends. So if you want more security stuff, more vulnerabilities, more low level stuff, basically just switch to his channel, which is YouTube slash C slash Mormus CTF. There's going to be a link just on the screen, the next screen. So that's it. I'm going to leave you with uh, some music, the ending screen with the new mission. And, uh, and yeah, thank you, Honorary Bot. See you tomorrow, everyone, and happy hacking and enjoy Mormos CTF show on his channel. So bye bye and see you tomorrow.
Watching seasons change.